I'd, I'd like you to tell everyone, I mean, how much are you earning on a monthly basis within your agency? Let's give this some credibility to start off with. We're at about 52,000 a month. You know, I don't do free trials and my contracts are a minimum of a year. I always recommend start off local brick and mortar businesses. It's how I got myself off the ground. You've got yourself off the ground that way. I know ev almost every successful agency owner I know who's making multiple five figures on a monthly basis started locally. So guys, take that advice. I'm not just saying it to you because I want to hog all the e-commerce stuff for myself. <laughs> it's a recipe that works and it's consistent, right? So if you're not focusing on local first, I'm sorry, but you gotta read. You gotta restructure how you're looking at stuff because ultimately the relationships you can have with people in person across a table, having a cup of coffee or a meal are a lot more valuable than the ones that you're gonna get over the phone and never meet the person because at that point you're just seen as disposable. You connected digitally, you're gonna leave digitally. And then the real big thing when it comes to scaling our agency specifically, just more strategic business partnerships. Uh, you know, for instance, and this is probably the single biggest tip that could help anyone in the academy or anyone that wants to get into digital marketing. Look at people that do. What's up guys, Jordan here. So today we are joined by Stephen Comer, who's a member of the Affluent Academy and he has a wildly successful marketing agency called Ascension Digital. Now, Stephen is, <laughs> he's doing such an incredible job. He's generating multiple five figures on a monthly basis. I needed to get him on an interview today because he's doing some stuff that I don't see any other agencies doing and we're gonna be talking about that today. So Stephen, do you wanna just introduce yourself and maybe let everybody know how you came to being 22 years old and owning the most successful digital marketing agency in your local area. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, Jordan, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I know that you're a busy gentleman as much as I am myself. Uh, so that it is truly a pleasure to connect with you so that we can give back to the platform that we're both pretty active on and even the one that you threw together. So uh, a little bit about me. I was born in Caracas, Venezuela uh, 22 years ago. We left that hellhole after uh, it started to get a little not so good to live in. And then we uh, emigrated to the States where my mom actually grew up. So uh, a little bit beyond that, I started this business five years ago under a different name before it was e-commerce digital marketing, e-commerce with a K because the entire middle section of that word is my last name. Uh, and then once I started to bring in a partner, I didn't think it was fair to just market my name, even though it was hidden within the brand. Uh, so we decided to change it to Ascension Digital and we've just been growing ever since. And it's been a uh, interesting ride to say the least. Uh, it's been truly a pleasure and I'm blessed to be where I'm at today. Amazing. And so you said that uh, before we were chatting, you said that you started off actually offering web services, didn't you? And then you transitioned into yeah. social media marketing. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So the interesting thing about the position that I was in, I was shown website creation first and the value of SEO once you build a great website. Uh, the reason being is a lot of people, even when they travel, I mean, even in my local demographic, you have so much competition between little tiny niches like cosmetic dentists, chiropractors, restaurants, things like that. And whenever even locals are searching Google to see what's different, what's new, they have to see what comes up first. And they're generally going to pick one of the first five options that are presented to them. So SEO is an inherently valuable asset to any business. And then after about two years, I started to see that social media marketing was becoming more stable, stable in the sense that Facebook ads were easier to run. Uh, it wasn't so complicated. You were getting the right amount of reach for the money that you were investing into the platform. So I saw that as a good opportunity to mesh it with the other businesses. I mean, not necessarily businesses, but services that I was offering at the time so that I could offer more comprehensive, cohesive packages. Amazing. And so how did you upsell that service to other people? So your existing customers, how were you upselling them onto to social media? So it's inherently dependent on the industry. You know, there's some that work well with social media. There's some that just don't. Uh, so if they were already seeing great success with SEO and getting good website traffic, it was kind of a no brainer. It's like, oh, we're going to put money into this too, because everything else that you've done has generated a phenomenal return thus far. So it's not a hard upsell. And that was one thing that, um, you know, I do a little differently, especially than what you suggest in the course. You know, I don't do free trials and my contracts are a minimum of a year. And the reason that I do that is because, uh, whenever we work with businesses, they know that marketing is not a short-term play because any short-term play anywhere, whether it's short-term money, short-term marketing, short-term business, you know that as quickly as it came, it can go. So whenever we explain that up front and say that, you know, building a sustainable brand takes a sustainable amount of time to invest into it, 
people are really understanding of that. And that's why I think that, you know, our industry specifically, it's the single most competitive freelance space in the world right now. Correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but it's getting diluted with a lot of people that are, you know, unfortunately getting burned by people in our positions that aren't generating comprehensive results, which is why I think those short term uh, contracts don't really benefit this industry any value in the long run, because mm. you have people that know that, you know, this is their first time getting their feet wet in the industry and doing this firsthand. So whenever you look at the space as a whole, it's starting to get a bad name because people are getting burned two and three times. And then they're like, oh, are you going to burn me too? I want to see your entire operation before we get into this. And whenever people are getting that kind of stigma attached to digital marketers nowadays, it's really difficult for the established brands that have already done phenomenal work and are showing people, hey, these are the results we generate and that's still not good enough. So one thing that I think that you did really well with the course was you're adding supplemental value as people continue to learn in the form of those additional modules that are coming out. I think we're up to eight now. Correct me if I'm yeah, wrong. Yeah, eight, and then there's gonna we're gonna be up to eleven, which will be finished as of Sunday. So yeah, it's gonna be three more modules coming. So yeah, it's I, I completely agree with you. There is this thing within digital marketing, especially in the, in the social media marketing space, where uh, people take on bad information which isn't up to date and they will start signing up clients and not really know what they're doing and so a lot of companies can get burned and so there is that distrust sometimes within the industry and especially in certain more saturated areas I mean but, but long contracts are definitely the way forward we had someone even just yesterday in the program who signed a six month contract with I, I think you saw your comment on there with the, the with the uh, real estate client, but if somebody's watching this right now, like okay, this is all well and good, I, but I'd love to sign up a year client. How or what advice would you give them on how you can actually convince somebody to sign a long term contract with you? So it's a little easier to do once you're established. I think that's a given. Uh, so at the beginning, even if you do feel like a free trial is the right way to go, just to show them proof of concept, then if it's good, the contract link's not going to matter because you're showing them that these results regardless of the time frame that you work together are sustainable. And even with the markets changing the way they are, I mean, there's even, I trade stocks on the side too. I do uh, options and calls and whatnot. So, you know, you see how coronavirus, you know, a very frequent thing nowadays that you don't go a day without hearing about uh, affecting markets in certain ways. Local markets get affected the same way, but by things that are regional. So whenever you have that change in the way that the community starts to receive information, especially with how uh, spammy ads are nowadays. The thing that I've told everybody that I've talked with in this group as well as other groups is that you have to be suggestive and not pushy. And that's why my call strategy works. And then we can get into that later on, on during this call if you'd like. Uh, but we always look at the mid to long term play because if you like, again, if you look at the short term, what comes easy will go easy. So you need to be able to kind of build that trust with your prospects and say, hey, I'm here for the long term relationship that we're going to foster and build together. That's also going to generate a phenomenal return on investment, as well as an inherent sense of brand value in your community that is going to be unparalleled anywhere else. Amazing. Amazing. And let's uh, let's say let's let's get into that. Let's get into how you're actually closing clients, what you are doing on the phone with people, because I think that's where people are really going to be getting the value here. I mean. I'd, I'd like you to tell everyone, I mean, how much are you earning on a monthly basis within your agency? Let's give this some credibility to start off with. We're at about 52,000 a month. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. An agency doing 52,000 a month on a, <laughs> with a owner who's 22 years old. And that's nothing short of phenomenal. And I'm sure so many people watching this right now are going to be so inspired about that. And so... What they want to know is how are you actually doing this? How are you closing these clients? What are you doing differently? I know, so you're calling, which is great. So what, what are you doing differently from other agencies? And what mistakes are other agencies making that you are seeing those same mistakes that they're making? So step one, what are we doing? I have a three call, four step plan that really makes the perspective shift between salesperson and equal. So what we do is we have a call setter and I know that the people just starting out probably don't have a call setter. This might be an easy way to bring in a significant other, a friend of yours that's also interested in entrepreneurship that kind of wants some skin in the game um, in order to kind of build that value faster. So what we do is we have our call setter call the business that we're about to prospect uh, about two days before we do a closing call. Reason being is we want to get to know the gatekeeper before they realize we're trying to sell them something. So we'll call a uh, given you know, medical office, for example, and say, uh, whenever they answer the phone, 
the secretary, the office manager, whatever their name is, you want to figure out what their name is. You want to end the call after that. You might want to act like a patient or something like that uh, in order just to get them comfortable so that whenever they think you're going to come in, you're going to actually close them. So you get the name of the receptionist, write it down in our sales prospecting notebook or in our uh, CRM. We have notes for all those things. Uh, and then the next day we call, that's our actual lead gen call. So whenever we call, we're going to say, hey, Susie, is Greg in? Just saw something that's wrong with his marketing. We need to get a hold of him as quickly as possible. So because they don't know you, and it seems like you know the situation a lot better than they do, they feel like they owe you something just to keep things running smoothly. So they look at the appointment book, they see where there's an opening, and then we set the call for within the next 24 hours because we don't want to do it a week later whenever they forget about it or they're not interested anymore. And you also don't want to do it immediately because if they're tied up with something, it's really unlikely. So okay. you want to do it within 24 hours, and then I get on the call. I'm not on either of the initial calls. So what my call setter will do is say, hey, Susie, this is Steve Calmer. He's one of the co-founder co-founders of our business. And then we'll introduce everybody and then I'll speak with the business owner so that they see me as an equal and not a salesperson. They have a lot more trust. They're a lot more willing to be receptive to what we have to say as well as take action on that. So the call that I'm on, this is where the four steps come into play. First and foremost, you want to build personal trust with the prospect. You want to be able to see how they react to things relative to their personal life and then how it affects their business. And you want to see what their personal goals are. I don't script these calls. I just always try and get to one question for each step. So the first step is to get their personal goals out on the table and verbalize. Once you know what their personal goals are, you want to transition into knowing a little bit more about their business. So, you know, the industry that they're in, how competitive it is, what they offer, um, you know, things of that nature, things pertinent yeah. to the business that could help you understand how to market them best. And then the only thing that you want to know in this step is what their business goals are. So once you get their personal goals on one side and their business goals on the other, you try and connect them where they can without trying to force it. And then you fill the gaps with your service where they don't connect. So say, for instance, someone wants to give back to the community. They want to be able to, you know, leave a legacy locally for their family. And they might want to leave the business to their kids whenever they want to retire. The business goals could consist of, you know, increasing revenues, also giving back to the community. And then maybe the last one doesn't connect. And say, you know, leaving a legacy, you can leave a legacy with your business if it's branded well. So you insert service here. Uh, you're allowing them to see the facilitation of what you bring to the table as well as the real practical use it adds to their business. Mm -hmm. So once you make that connection, you move into step three, which is solidifying the trust and, you know, starting to understand the business as deeply as possible. This is where you'll be able to ask questions like, what is your gross revenue? What is your net income? What are your business, business biggest expenses? Uh, what are you spending on marketing already? And this, if they really do trust you and they are going to move towards a close, they're going to not hesitate to tell you that information. And the reason is because they already trust you. They already see you as an equal in the space that can help them to some capacity uh, in an area that isn't their strong suit. So whenever you understand that, it's essentially just moving to step four, which is terms and closing. It's very simple. It works about 65 to 70 percent of the time. So whenever you're looking at a close rate of almost uh, one to two, whenever a lot of people are getting 10 calls and not landing a single one, you know, if you can land five in a day, I think people would, you know, just yeah. completely destroy the industry. But that's not what's happening because people aren't aware that you want to be seen as an equal and not a salesperson. I think people focus too much on pushing the service and not enough about pushing themselves as a person because the more trust that you can provide, the more trust they're going to have in you to do what you say you're going to do. 100%. I couldn't agree more with what you just said is that it's not it's not about the service, it's about you. And people buy into you as an individual. When you're selling something, no matter what you're selling, people buy into you as an individual, like they buy into a company. You can yeah. buy the same product of five different companies, but you're going to buy it off one of them because you buy into that company more. It's the reason why people buy an iPhone, and I still have an iPhone, even though the iPhone does less things than other more competitive phones out there for less money. But yeah. you're buying into that brand and people buy into you as an individual. And as I go go through in the academy, it's so important to build enough authority throughout a meeting and to to again be as you said be seen as an equal and in some cases you need to be a little bit further ahead in their perception they need to perceive you as somebody that's greater than them in the position in whatever it is that you're trying to sell so mm -hmm. you need to share enough value and you need to assert enough authority throughout and what you were going through with your like your question setting is it's pretty much exactly what we go through in the discovery stage in the the meeting strategy but what i love 
about what you're doing. What I really love, and it's, it's interesting because it's, it's like we haven't had this conversation beforehand, but it's what something that we've just started doing within our agency about three months ago is I love the the, the appointment setting strategy in the way that you're, you're, you're learning the secretary's or gatekeeper's name first mm -hmm. before you're then pitching them onto the business owner. Have you ever had anybody call you out on that and say, hey, how do you know my name? It or depends. It inherently depends on how quickly you can get the whole message out before they have time to interrupt you. Uh, so with that being said, an example would be like if you know the business locally, say it's a family friend that you're prospecting, you just don't know the secretary. If you get out that you know the owner's name first before the secretary, they're going to ask like either one, how do you know who we are? Or two, how do you know him? But I don't know you. Uh, and I'm not assuming that the business owner is always a man. That's not something that you know I want to get into. But it's something that I think a lot of people overlook whenever you're kind of skipping steps you can misstep because of it. So if you don't hit their name first and then move into the business owner's name, they don't feel that interpersonal connection because they didn't come first. Yeah, yeah, I love that. That's that, that's great. And it's actually, we have in, in our company, kind of un unknowingly, we, we've got a sales team now within the agency and they're calling up leads. They're, they're getting so many meetings at the moment. And we've noticed that when we then actually jump on a call, I say we, because I jump on a call with Joe as well, who's our direct, uh, operations director. And when we jump on a call, the positioning and the level of respect is raised so much higher because as you said, they no longer see you as a salesperson. It's like, okay, I've already spoken to the sales guy and now I'm speaking to the big dog. And so that level of authority, you you just enter at a, at a completely different level. And so you don't have to build yourself up to that point. You're already at it straight from the go, which makes it easier to ask your discovery questions, which makes it easier to ask about revenue and, and profit margins and things like that. And it just, it just breaks down that barrier Mm -hmm. um, which, which, yeah, I, I think that's amazing advice for anyone watching this right now. Start consciously, and this is why I say to people, don't just call up a company and say, hey, can I speak to the owner, please? That's why you need to be, get personal with these people. You need to build enough authority. If you have somebody else that you can work with in your agency, get them to a set, a, a set meetings with you. And if you don't, and you've already got clients, then get a salesman. You can hire a salesman and pay them 10% reoccurring income for the clients that you sign on the meetings that they set for you. I don't know what your setup is with that, but we do that. We set, we would give them like 10% of reoccurring income for the retainers that we close. That's a huge earning for a salesman for meeting setting. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, yeah, it's a no brainer. So, and you don't have to pay somebody then a salary to do that. Nope. So I think, I, th I think we've got, I think that's, that, that's incredibly valuable for people. And thank you for giving that away for, for Absolutely. free on this video. Um, but what I'd love to know, uh, one of the biggest things is how do you go from launching an, a, a business, a, a digital marketing agency at 17, 18 years old and scaling so quickly and then adapting to those lifestyle changes at the same time? So how, do, how was scaling for you? And what what do people have to be careful about when they are looking to scale their business as life changes? This is a tough question because everybody deals with stress differently. And the reason that that matters is because, say for instance, you close three clients in a week, but you still have yet to do any work at all relative to the space or the services that you offer. Because you're getting your feet wet in different niches, I mean, they could even be the same niche, but for simplicity's sake, we'll say that they're all different niches. Whenever you're trying to run ads for one that have completely different metrics to pay attention to than the other, it gives you diversity, but it also allows you to confuse things easier. Not to mention, you know, as a student myself, like I said, I'm graduating in April, so I'll be done relatively soon so that this can be my full time thing, at least for the summer while I'm getting my other two businesses off the ground. But it's a matter of essentially understanding what you're offering as well as understanding the knowledge to offer that service or value. Uh, so if you don't have that strong basis beforehand, which is essentially the point of these courses, right, is to give people a knowledge base before you teach them how to go prospect. Because if they do the prospecting before, you know, understanding how to do what they're offering, then ultimately they're screwed. So you have to be able to understand the needs of the client. And then it, it really all boils back down to building trust. Because if you don't have trust with people, they're not going to be as lenient with you. If they see you as a pushy salesperson, then ultimately what you're going to be stuck with is an unhappy client that's going to either, you know, blackball you in the community if they have some sort of influence there. Or if it's a it's worse if it's a family friend for sure or a family member because they knew to trust you right from the start and then you completely destroyed that trust. So it's always easier to start 
you know, prospecting with the people that you know first, but I would say don't let that be your main focus because you want to be able to deliver for people that you don't know so that you know that you can deliver for the people that you do know. So yeah. that's the single most important thing. And just understanding to set time aside to do the work. You know, that was one thing that at first for me, trying to schedule and coordinate with my classes so that I could focus on getting each one of these tasks done, you know, from start to finish, beginning of the day to the end of the day, it really made my life easier to start doing to-do lists because if I just knew what I had to do that day, it was a lot easier for me to just keep checking things off the list. Now, the inherent issue with that is, is that if you have a list that has 30 things on it, it's probably relatively unlikely that you're going to get it done throughout the day. So whenever I started to get to that point, I knew I needed help, which is when I started to actually grow. And then the real big thing when it comes to scaling our agency specifically, just more strategic business partnerships, you know, working with people locally, uh, you know, for instance, and this is probably the single biggest tip that could help anyone in the academy or anyone that wants to get into digital marketing. Look at people that do print marketing and build a relationship with them so you can tap into their existing client base. Um, it's the yeah. single largest move I think we've ever made. Uh, so whenever we have a local printing company here that, you know, works with big companies like MGM Grand in Las Vegas and, you know, a bunch of other world renowned companies and you're tapping into that network, say, I mean, they have like 4,000 people that they do work for, but say we even get 10% of that, that's an additional 40 clients. 40 clients is a lifetime sustainable business as long as this yeah. industry doesn't go to shit, you know? Yeah. 100%. That's a that's a big one. I, I actually partnered with a company who did um, bus advertisements. So they did like all the big physical advertisements on buses. And I knew the guy, his name's Bernie, and he lives in my city. And I actually used to know him from when I used to do nightclub events. And just so happened, I was like, shit, I know this guy who's in physical advertisement. And then it's like, then all of a sudden there's this exchange. It's like my clients could need his service and then his clients need my service. And yeah, that's a, that's a massive thing that people overlook is like the power of partnerships and relationships. And so many people are afraid to network with others because they're like, I just need to spend all my day calling people. And whilst I'm like a numbers guy and I say, look, you need to stick to your target to know your numbers. But at the same time, I will always allocate time to expand my knowledge and expand like my networking base. So I used to go to networking mm -hmm. events in my local city, whereas you see other online entrepreneurs like, oh, you don't have time for networking. You just need to focus and you just need to grind. Well, actually, one relationship that you made and by taking a whole afternoon off could change your entire business, like could completely transform your business. So I always recommend allocating time for networking. It's yeah, I still do that to this day. You know, I'm part of four networking groups locally, as well as, you know, a bunch of groups on Facebook that we're able to build value in relatively simply, you know, just pick up the phone, get in there, leave a line and then call it a day. Um, but the best relationships that I had, or at least working relationships I've found have been through networking events because you're all with like minded people that want to influence something local. And the yeah. second that you kind of dominate your local market, it's easier to scale outside of that because, you know, it's something that I've actually told a lot of people on calls that I've had within group members is that if you don't focus on building your brand locally and it's going to start out very sparse and all over the place, it's a lot harder to get recognition. It's incredibly hard because you're like mold on old cheese. It's like it starts in different places and you don't really know how it's going to look by the end of it. But if you start in one spot and keeps growing and growing and growing, it's a lot more noticeable. You're paying a lot yeah. more attention to it. So if you're not focusing on local first, I'm sorry, but you got to read, you got to restructure how you're looking at stuff because ultimately the relationships you can have with people in person across a table, having a cup of coffee or a meal are a lot more valuable than the ones that you're going to get over the phone and never meet the person. Because at that point, you're just seen as disposable. You connected digitally, you're going to leave digitally. Whereas if it's a person that you interact with in a human way, you're able to build more trust faster and also get more done. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And I think you know, I, I, one thing I always feel like when I tell people, look, don't go for uh, e-commerce, info product companies, all that type of thing, like international companies first, go for local brick and mortar. I feel like people think, oh, Jordan, that's because you just want them for yourself. Like, it's actually like I say oh. this because I know that I started my business locally and not only did, yes, I signed up some, some, some clients which weren't suitable. Yes, some of them I had bad relationships with, but I got so many referrals that got me so far off the ground. And because I had had... I, I never really truly experienced proper entrepreneurship, quitting my job, working for myself until I had this agency. It enabled me to learn so much about marketing and about myself and about signing clients and about relationships and build that, build that authority in my area. 
And that just helped me propel myself so much. It just set me up perfectly for being able to then work with international clients when it's harder to build a relationship or when it's harder to maintain that trust with somebody or tr- or actually just like you said, you, you built a relationship online. And so it almost makes you more disposable. Yeah. And, and so once you start off locally, you're going to be able to build more authority. You're going to have enough revenue to be able to play around with more things. You're going to be less stressed. And so you're going to be focusing for higher ticket higher quality clients you'll have more time to train yourself and so i always recommend start off local brick and mortar businesses it's how i got myself off the ground you've got yourself off the ground that way i know almost every successful agency owner i know who's making multiple five figures on a monthly basis started locally and that's got to happen for a reason um so guys take that advice i'm not just saying it to you because i want to hog all the e-commerce stuff for myself (laughs) it's a recipe that works and it's consistent right so that's why i think it's important to kind of push that narrative that you have to focus on local because it's a lot harder when people don't know who you are i mean as someone who's tried to build their brand i now given i'm a very bad hypocrite for this but uh i don't post ever really on social media You know, it's something that I'm too busy. My life is really not that interesting sitting at this desk, being on calls all day. You know, I do travel a lot. I'm going to be traveling in two weeks, uh, like a week and a half now. Uh, I'm going to Florida to a buddy's house for spring break. But it's one of those things that if you focus too much on being picture perfect online, and that's how you're going to represent yourself, it's very hard for people to understand who you really are. Now, if you do things consistently to show people, you know, what you're interested in, what you're passionate about, it's easier to build those uh, connections with people that might be able to give you a foot in the door somewhere. But whenever you try and be Instagram perfect, and I know that this is like, uh, it's a shot at a lot of influencers for sure, because that's how they get brand deals. That's how they make a living. They get a lot of likes and follows and whatever because of what they wear, what they don't wear, or uh, you know the things that they do, whether they're professional athletes or business people or entrepreneurs, whatever the case may be. It's hard for people to understand who you really are because if you're just kind of putting the same thing out there all the time, it's really it becomes forgettable. You know the premise of the person, but you don't know who they really are. So mm-hmm. as I continue to get more uh, interesting things to develop and kind of record and have a team follow me so that I can record what I'm doing on a daily basis, not so much like Gary V, but uh, you know something of interest to people in this space or you know that are a part of my circle already, it's important to show people that reality doesn't have to be hidden online. It can yeah. be something that's shared with people and more genuine. That's content that really attracts people nowadays and that we'd use that same mindset in business yeah amazing i completely agree i completely agree with everything you're saying and so just i think we've just we've just gone over 30 minutes and so let's round this up i think one one final thing i'd like to cover that i've got written down is i want to know if somebody's watching this right now and there's they're struggling they're trying to sign their business they're watching you and they're like how the hell is this guy doing this and 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 how's jordan done this and how's all these other people do this and i'm i'm really working my ass off and struggling what would you say to somebody right now who's still hustling through they're trying to get that first client they're still trying to they're still trying to get there what would you say to that person that would possibly help them get to where they want to be two words it's probably the most engaged with post in the group since the group started but i got my tattoo last week keep going (laughs) that's all you got to keep doing You know, it's really simple. It's a good reminder. And another, you know, reminder that I had is I make little gifts for myself so that I earn them. Like I got my watch, very nice date just by the way. Uh, (laughs) uh, I got this whenever I got 50 clients because I earned it. It wasn't something I could obviously afford it beforehand, but it wasn't something that I felt like I deserved until I hit another milestone. So if you're able to set up milestones for yourself and you just keep going, it's going to be worth it. You just can't give up whenever it's hard and you're not seeing a big return because you don't know the potential. It's like that uh, picture that you see on Instagram all the time with the motivation mindset accounts and whatever. There's two miners, one that's a foot away from the biggest diamond uh, collective underground in the world. And then there's one that stops after he gets one. You know, yeah. both people gave up whenever they got close or just got a little bit. If you keep going, you're going to strike a really, really successful life and you just have to keep going. We are finite on Earth, but time is infinite. So what you do in your limited amount of time leaves a legacy. So you have to remember that as you're doing things on a daily basis, you need to do the things that are getting you further closer to those goals, whether it's maintaining what you already have and helping it grow and facilitate new growth or you're investing all of your time, energy, money 
whatever resource you have into the things that haven't materialized yet, but you want to materialize. You have to manifest things. So just keep going. It's really simple to say and a lot harder to follow through with, but it's something that, you know, has been my mindset for the longest time. And once I had that mindset shift, it's imperative to my success. It's the only thing really that keeps me going today is knowing that how far I've come and how far I'm going to keep going. But yep. that's the thing. It still requires effort and movement. And it, you know, I get two hours of sleep a night. I've been doing that for a year, but I do it because I have the energy now and I'm not going to wait an additional 10 years to miss the opportunity. You have to yep. just keep going and suffer as, <laughs> as that is. <laughs> Guys, don't get two hours sleep. I don't recommend that. <laughs> that's, I don't recommend yeah, either. The, Steven's a machine. I don't, I don't, <laughs> that's not for the, that's not for the average guy. Mm -hmm. If I got two hours, I can, I can, I can do well on five. I think I can do well on five. Anything under five, I'm, I'm pretty impossible. And so two hours sleep that's 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 crazy well to me it feels like a power nap and that's why i haven't crashed yet because it feels like i've just gotten enough sleep to re-energize myself but if it's not two hours or not nine hours anything in between i feel completely ruined for the day because it was a little bit more than i needed but a lot less than i really need you know 100 percent, i'm with you wicked man well thank you so much for this Absolutely. and uh how uh, apart from the affluent academy obviously steven's a very active member of the affluent academy and i, I tell you what i love about this guy's always open about to jump on calls with people help them out in their journey and so obviously if you are in the academy make sure you reach out to steven say hi if you're not in the academy get in so you can reach out and say hi but apart from that if people want to reach out to you if they want to hear about what you're doing follow you where should they find you and i'll put links in the description as well so the facebook group keeps my facebook messages app pretty full uh if you really want to get my attention go to my instagram it's s-t-e-p-h-e-n-k-o-m-m-e-r there i have a lot less traffic because i'm not as engaged i post a lot on my stories every day but i don't post a whole lot of content so there's actually like uh actually just what we went over in the close uh you know the whole time is infinite yet we are finite thing i post stuff like that you know two three times a week connect with me over there it gets a lot less traffic than it, i do in the group so if you have anything that's pertinent that's the fastest way to get a hold of me other than that you can email me at skommer at ascensiondigital.org if you need uh or want to request any like uh, case studies or any of the tools that i use that's for the more professional questions i would think uh but if you have just a situation and you want to get a hold of me please feel free to do that via the facebook messenger amazing thank you so much for this Stephen. and uh, i'm sure we'll have another video in the future with an update when you hit 100k on a monthly basis i would be looking because you're going to keep going so much <laughs> i have to you have to it's on my wrist forever now i i have to do it i don't have a choice cheers guys cheers. thank you